Today we begin a highly requested series on Eileen Warnos. We'll start with her rough upbringing, discussing the hardships and abuse she endured. We'll then take a look at her travels around the country, earning money as a sex worker and racking up numerous arrests for assaults and robbery. Finally, we'll discuss her first murder, the various narratives she gave of it, and whether it was in cold blood or self-defense. I'm Mike. I'm Ian. And I'm Dave. If you've ever thought about trying to do some zipper fucking in your spare time down in the backwoods of Florida, don't. This is Necronomapod. I was in, in this, this, to me, this world is nothing but evil, and all of us are full of evil one way or another. And whatever we do, we have evil in us, all of us do. And my evil would just happen to come out because of the circumstances of what I was doing. Hitchhiking, hooking, on the road. I was a homeless person all my life. And then the hitchhiking hook and I learned off the homelessness and cruising all over the United States of America and stuff. And so learning how to be a hooker as a hitchhiker eventually got tiring in the end. So did either of you guys watch Monster in preparation for the next couple weeks? Uh, No, not for like 20 years. Yeah, I, I think I saw it my senior year of high school, maybe something like that. Damn. What year is it? Like 15 years, 20 years? Since I graduated high school? Or? No, since the movie was out. Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> we should have prepared for this. I'm looking it up. I'm going to say 2002. 2003. Oh, mm-hmm. come on. So how old is that? 19 years. Uh, Long time. Well, 18. Right. It's all 2021. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're the math guy here, man. I was going with my answer, not, not the correct one. <laughs> um, I haven't seen it, obviously, but good movie, right? She won some awards or won, an, an award, yeah. the award. She won the Oscar, right? Best uh, actress, I believe. Yeah. Pretty cool. It didn't how quite does, look like her I was going to say, how does a casting director look at uh, what is it? Are we going with, is it Eileen or Aileen? Eileen. Eileen. Okay. Uh I, I have not done any prep, even less than usual for the show. <laughs> I have not even seen the notes. <laughs> I've been so busy. I literally printed them as I was walking out the door. So Excellent. Like, yeah. Uh, I'll be learning literally as we go today. Um, how does like a casting director look at like a picture of Eileen and then like be like, Charlie Saren, we got it. It's a perfect <laughs> match. It's a valid point. She pulled it off though. We're going to talk about it later, but Eileen was pretty attractive back in the day before all that. Yeah. Florida drifting started. That'll take a toll on you. Yeah, that bad living will uh, take its toll for sure. You mean living in Florida? (laughs) Well, you know, and that'll take its toll on you as well. It's like one of those before meth, after meth, side by side pictures. Kind of. (laughs) Was she on the meth or no? Uh, Not that I know of, I don't think. I mean, I'm sure she was doing some drugs for sure. Some. Okay. I don't know if meth specifically, but choose math, not meth. That's good advice. <laughs> Something like that. I mean, it works. Yeah. yeah. New shirt coming to Amazon. Choose math, not meth. Mm-hmm. I'd wear that. Okay. <laughs> For sale. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. It's already sold. We'll be up there tomorrow. We haven't even designed it yet. <laughs> I can write it in my handwriting, which just looks like I'm on meth. <laughs> so it's just, it'll work. <laughs> People love your artwork. Yeah. Well, it's a top seller, Mike. It was fun. All right. Well, might as well just jump in. I'm ready to go. This is, we should say this has been a highly requested subject for us. We get, we've been getting requests for this for Eileen for years. So hopefully people enjoy it. We haven't done a a female since what? Catherine Knight, the pride of Australia. Uh, Well, we did Carla Homolka. Oh, that's right. And a bonus. Patreon. Yeah. Other than that. Yeah. Few and far between. Who's that? Bell Guinness, that babe. Yeah, that was, that was a long another time one. Ago yeah, on Patreon. We apparently we do all the women on Patreon. Hmm. Not today. <laughs> nope. <laughs> all right, let's go. So when you read about Eileen Warnos, even to this day, uh, you see headlines calling her the first female serial killer, which is obviously not true. 
Um, we're going to see later on that Eileen's case is something that the media jumped all over to sell newspapers, magazines, and then eventual movie deals. That's really out of the ordinary. They don't ever <laughs> do things like that. So, okay. Not only are there female serial killers before Eileen, but female serial killers are a lot more complex than male ones. The U.S. Department of Justice published a study in 1998 regarding female serial killers and how they differed from male ones. The biggest difference besides motives is that statistically female serial killers are more successful in murder and more determined to murder than men. Women killers are typically very good at planning, leaving them very hard to catch. And the DOJ believes there is a significant portion of female serial killers in the world that have not been caught and probably won't be. Well, wow, that's uh, terrifying. <laughs> I was going to say terrifying. <laughs> we all know women are, are uh, much smarter than men, so that's a little yeah. scary. They're very good at planning. Be a little yeah, nicer yeah. to uh, that female you bump into at the bar, Pally's out there, because uh, she might be one of them. Next thing you know, you're knifed and thrown in a dumpster. <laughs> and nobody will ever know who did it. Nope. She's on to the next. Your balls are ball sack stuffed in your throat and you're bleeding out. <laughs> oh, that's just cruel. <laughs> Look, ladies, if you're going to kill a guy, leave his balls alone, please. And his dangle. Leave it alone. You'd prefer not to be uh, mutilated. Mutilated like that? If you're going to kill me, don't mutilate me. You want an open know. casket so people can remember you as you were in life? I have a fuck about that. I just, I'm afraid I'm going to feel a lot of pain. I don't want that. Yeah. I want. I also want to be clear. If I die, there, there should be no casket or no viewing or no seeing of my body. Nothing like, like that. Just no. None of that. It's odd. I don't want that for me. I would like. I would expect a procession of hoes, college hoes, <laughs> like, around the block coming to pay their respects. Well, we can do a procession of hoes. I just wanted to be involved. You guys just show up, have some beads, have a keg of beer, have a party. What's the? <laughs> You're thinking so hard about something or something right now. Let's see what's the. The 50 cent song everywhere i go i'm oh, yeah. surrounded by hoes <laughs> you have permission to play that <laughs> <laughs> so they broke female serial killers into categories these include the black widow who is the most careful and methodical or murders and kills people who she is a close personal relationship with the angel of death who often murders in a hospital or nursing home and the sexual predator, but sexually motivated serial killing when it comes to women is that they almost always work as a team with a man, which would be the most popular example, Carlo Homolka and Paul Bernardo. Do you think that means that the men talk them into it? If you go off Carla and Paul, it just seemed like, she was into what he was, it was into. It was just part of like their fetish. And it worked out right? for like, them. But she needed that spark of a partner who was also into it to get going down that path, I think. Yeah. Which is interesting. It is interesting. It's the opposite of men. When I was looking at this DOJ thing, I couldn't find like the specific, a specific name that they were referring to, but they said lone sexual female serial killers. It made up 2% of like historically. Meanwhile, have we ever covered a male serial killer that didn't involve some sex? It's always sexual it for exist. guys. Yeah. It doesn't exist. That reminds me, before I forget, I saw on Twitter, do you see this the other day? Somebody posted, uh, if you could if you could go back and say three words to your 18-year-old self, what would they be? And BTK's daughter quote tweeted it and said, dad is BTK. <laughs> God damn. Did you see that? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Holy shit, is that real? <laughs> Was it real or was yeah, it? Yeah, it was her. The one that wrote the book. Dad is BTK. That's fucking crazy. Oh. <laughs> okay. Sorry. It's just, I thought that was triggered something funny. That you said that was very intense. So, so it's women are motivated by revenge and anger. Men are motivated by sex to kill. And then, you know, the Black Widow, a lot of that's monetary. Marry husbands, kill them off consecutively over and over again. Yeah, and move on. Okay. I wouldn't know because we didn't cover that one yet. But once you told me about it, I'd never forget. I'd forget. <laughs> you guys are both looking at me so seriously. Like, I'm just kidding. The biggest question with Eileen is what was her motive? Was it self-defense? Was it monetary? Like a robbery that ended in murder? And then Eileen ended up joining the act of killing. 
The other issue with figuring out Eileen's story is that she was a drifter, and a lot of this is her version of events with no one to corroborate. Eileen was also suffering from mental illness and being manipulated by outside people, which makes this whole story even muddier to try and figure out. I used two books for the outline, Dear Dawn, Eileen in Her Own Words, and Monster, both great true crime books, um, but there is so much directly from Eileen I thought it would be interesting to quote her throughout this outline more than we've done some other ones uh, and see things a bit more from her point of view. Yeah, for sure. That's cool. Regarding her early life, Eileen said, quote, my mother plucked me out of her belly and left me with my grandparents. We never knew the damned whore. We never saw her again except for funerals. I spit on her. She can go to hell. Our mother shit canned us two kids. The motherfucking bitch whore sent us in a hand basket to hell. My stepfather would beat me often after school or if I came home late. He'd make me cut down a willow branch and he'd use that. I soon learned that the thicker the branch, the less it hurt. Sometimes he used to beat me with a belt and then he made me clean it. Like clean the blood off? Clean the belt. And yeah, I guess if there was blood on there. Not a great start. Also, geez, the language. Could you not swear so fucking much? (laughs) Eileen Warnos was born February 29th, 1956 in Detroit, Michigan to 14-year-old Diane Warnos and 19-year-old Leo Pittman. Eileen had an older brother named Keith who was a year or two older than her. When Diane got pregnant with Keith, Eileen's grandmother lied about Diane's age so that she could marry Leo, but this marriage went south really quick. So she was born on a leap year. So by my calculation, she was a minor when she was uh, all this went down. So she should not have been charged as an adult. Dave rests his case. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Can't argue with that. What are you using? So how does, only how does the like, prosecution come after that? Like 10 years old. I agree. Okay. No argument from me. Just like that guy uh, that uh, was executed. And what happened? Do you see that? Mm-mm. And he, he came back to life, so he's claiming that he oh, served yeah, his yeah. life sentence because yeah. he died. I sent that back. to you guys. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's right. Technically, he's got a point, right? Yeah. It wasn't through the execution, though, right? Like, he got sick and something. Like, somehow he had, like, was pronounced or was, like, dead. Yeah. Legal, like, that clinically dead for a few minutes and then came back and was like, well, that was a life. <laughs> <laughs> this is can my I, life, too. Can I go now? <laughs> Let's open the gates, bitch. Don't they say with the death penalty, aren't there some like legal words to that, like dead until, or like sometimes they get like 99 life sentences, you know, if there's there's more uh, counts to whatever, but I always thought there was some odd wording when you're sentenced to death. It's like you're dead until dead, but you know, there's some legal speak. I would entertain a conversation on if you were clinically dead, you know, maybe you get a second chance. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Depending. Would you want to live in your neighborhood? Depending. I don't know. Should be a review committee at least. Okay. Let's see what, let's see, hear the guy out. Before Eileen was able to have any memory of her father, Leo, he was arrested for the kidnapping and rape of a seven-year-old girl. Leo was in two mental health facilities and after being moved to a prison in 1971, he hanged himself. Throughout this time, Diane was struggling to raise two kids by herself, and in 1960, she took Eileen and Keith to her parents' house in Troy, Michigan, and never came back for them. So pretty rough start at this point. Yeah, and especially, and this is a time, 60s, 15-year-old with two kids and the husband's in jail. Yeah. It's a hard go. Her grandfather... Laurie Warnos and her grandmother, Britta, officially adopted Eileen and Keith on March 18th, 1960. Keith and Eileen were raised alongside Laurie and Britta's biological children, Barry and Laurie, but they didn't disclose that to Keith and Eileen, that they were their grandparents. They had never met them before. They were very young and they just raised them that they were their own kids And just kept it as this really weird secret in the household. Mm. That's healthy. I think that happens a lot sometimes with situations like that. And you grow up and you learn like your 
mom was your grandma. You know what I mean? Or you're like that you're raised as your as your mom's your sister. Or you find out that your mom. Thing, All right, things, we get it, Dave. Like it's an Arkansas joke. We get it. Okay. <laughs> well, that happened to Ted, Ted Bundy. He grew. Yeah, yeah, he grew right. up. You know, thinking similar. With I just his, think it fucks you up down the road mentally. It really fucked him up. That yeah. really sent him for. So similar thing here with Eileen and Ted Bundy. Same kind of weird relationship going on there. Like when you find out later, you aren't really who you thought you were your whole life. I, I mean, I think it has a tendency to to fuck you up. Yeah. David Berkowitz too. Remember, he had that whole idea of his mom. And then when he met her in person, his biological mom, oh, that's right. it was yeah. such a letdown for him. At six years old, Eileen started to get into trouble, specifically setting things on fire, which eventually led to her burning her face really bad. This behavior also led to Lowry beating Eileen and not the socially acceptable spankings for 1960s, but brutal beatings with a belt. Lari would force Eileen to strip naked and either bend over a chair or lay face down on the bed and would beat her with the belt, yelling stuff like, quote, you ain't even worthy of the air you breathe. Kids Eileen grew up with recalled her showing up to school with bruises and cuts on her as a kid. It's rumored among people that knew Eileen very well that her grandfather, Lowry, was raping her from an early age. And we're going to bring that up in a bit. But what is known is that Eileen was sexually active with her brother Keith early in childhood, but it's not exactly sure how early that started. Uh, there's nothing good about this story so far. My goodness. Around nine or 10 years old, Eileen was already drinking and there was a spot in the neighborhood that local kids called the pits and it was in the woods pointing to Eileen being sexually abused by Lowry she started to have sex with local boys in exchange for cigarettes, which earned her an absolutely disgusting nickname, Cigarette Pig. This was all done in secret. None of the boys wanted to be publicly associated with Eileen. When she would come around, they would throw rocks at her, stuff like that. Um, and we know this is 100% true because a few of those boys came out, you know, after they grew up, they came forward after everything happened in this story. And had a lot of remorse for how they treated Eileen. It's really sad. I don't like this story very much. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> geez. Wish I would have read the notes. So I could have mentally prepared for this shit. Yeah. That, that nickname really, really bugged me to t type in that out. I didn't like that at all. At 11. Yeah. Oh, at 11 years old, Eileen learned that Lowry and Britta were actually her grandparents. And this set her on a path of lashing out and constantly being in trouble. She had one friend at the time, Dawn Botkins, who would end up being Eileen's friend until the end and is the author of that book, Dear Dawn. These two would hitchhike around, which led to other terrible things happening to Eileen, like her going to a party at 12 years old and being raped by two boys while she was passed out drunk. This is not the feel-good story of the year, Ian. I thought you were going to say the feel-good story that you were expecting. Um, I, I was not expecting that, but good God. Did the movie Monster not cover all of this? I don't remember. It's been so long. I think it was mostly focused on adulthood, wasn't it? Yeah. By 14 years old, Eileen was setting fires in school, and one teacher wrote in a report about Eileen, quote, it is vital for this girl's welfare that she seeks counseling immediately, but no one ever helped Eileen. Around this time, Eileen started hanging out with a man in the area named Chief. Chief was pretty much known as the local pedophile, just a really creepy guy that was always around kids, always had sex workers at his house, just kind of stay away from him. But Eileen didn't have a record player at home to listen to music, so Chief would invite Eileen over to listen to music. At 14 years old, Eileen got pregnant. Some say that it was Laurie's. Some say that it was Chief's. Either way, Eileen was put into a home for unwed mothers while she was pregnant, and the baby was immediately given up for adoption. To this day, it's not clear if, if her baby boy ever found out that Eileen was his biological mom or not. Nothing is known about that. You imagine you go looking for your mom when you turn into an adult, and that's what you find at the end of your search. That's a tough day. Not even an adult. 14, 15. I mean, the kid, if when the kid, the adopted kid oh, I see comes of mean. age later on and gotcha. searches for his biological mother. Yeah. Yikes. 
Eileen went back to her house and Lori kicked her and Keith out for good. And Eileen ended up living in a makeshift camp in the woods at the end of her street. Like out in the Michigan winter snow, just lived out there toughing it out. And she still went to school. She didn't drop out of school at this wow. point. She was still going to school. And that's why I said earlier when I said no one helped Eileen, no one fucking helped Eileen. Everybody knew that she was living out in the woods and nobody in this town helped her. If she could have gotten like one person to help her throughout this shit, this, we might not even yeah. be doing a show on her. I think we're going down a path here. We're already, you know, starting to garner sympathy for her. And I wonder if why we don't look at male serial killers the same way who have similar upbringings, but I'm already starting to feel some sympathy for what lies ahead. I feel like in the male ones though, we always do. Or at least I do a little bit at the beginning. Yeah. Like there's there, some of those were so terrible. Who was the one that had to live like in that little under the floor? Ed Kemper. Ed Kemper. Yeah. Like that was fucking terribly sad. It was, it was awful. And then they start doing their shit though. And, and, and I, I don't know where the story goes, but yeah, then like, no. he starts doing a shit and you quickly are like, okay, yeah, right. I just find it interesting. And I'm, I'm wondering whether more sympathy, I don't know if it's given towards females. I don't know at this point. I'm just thinking ahead towards the end of the story. I don't know if it's like maybe some of those guys like Kemper, the, the brutality of it versus what, a, yeah. a, what a woman serial killer would sure. commit. There's no woman, you know, cutting off someone's head and fucking it. Like Kemper. Yeah, that's a whole different level. <laughs> sure. Yeah, oh, just an interesting Also, thought. since I'm we'll not see. aware at all of where this story goes, at this point, this is just a little girl who's been abused her whole life. Yeah, That is sure. what the story is to me sure. right now. Not long after she was kicked out, her grandmother, Britta, died from liver failure due to alcoholism. And after Eileen realized that she could survive in harsh conditions, on her own, she dropped out of school and fully became a drifter, just hitchhiking across the country. After Eileen started drifting, the next time she showed up on any records was 1974 when she was arrested using the alias Sandra Kretsch in Jefferson County, Colorado, for driving drunk and shooting a 22 out the window in the air. Eileen somehow made bail for these charges and then skipped town. In March of 1976, Eileen got married to a multimillionaire named Louis Fell. Louis Fell was 69 years old at the time and had picked up Eileen while she was hitchhiking. You see pictures of Eileen back in at this time when when she was in her 20s versus pictures when she was arrested and on trial. And it's completely different. Like she was really attractive oh, back yeah, in the day. Absolutely. And Eileen and Lewis both knew exactly what they were after. Eileen wanted his money and Lewis wanted this young off the rails woman in his life. Just a, you know, he was a widower. So multimillionaire, multimillionaire widower. And Ian, you joke about Jody Arias being marriage material. This guy's like, she's marriage material. I'm actually going to marry her. <laughs> hmm. Is he joking? Well, no, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> People in Lewis's life were like, what the hell are you doing? While Eileen made sure to give everybody a big fuck you back in Michigan. I say big fuck you to everyone in Michigan every day. <laughs> OH! <laughs> <laughs> a few months after Eileen got married, her grandfather, Lowry, committed suicide. Eileen went back to Michigan for the funeral told everyone to fuck themselves, lit a cigarette, and blew smoke in Laurie's face while he laid in his coffin. And she walked out and told everyone to fuck off. I, uh, I kind of like that. It's one of the most badass Fantastic. things ever. <laughs> Another reason why I don't want to have my body link. Because I don't want a chance to do that to me. How many people out there want to blow smoke in my face? Goddamn. They'll all be trying to cut your dick off to mount it at home. Well, it is a prize possession. That's, that's what I'm saying. It's already spoken for. Okay. It's in my will. Don't worry about Does it. Does the studio here get it? We can mount it on the wall. <laughs> I'll help you have a magnifying glass. <laughs> I just mean penis to shrivel when you die. Oh, of course. Yeah. Ten inches quickly becomes half an inch. <laughs> <laughs> I read it online. <laughs> WebMD. On July 13th, 1976, Eileen and Lewis got into a big fight because Eileen wanted to go to the bar and Lewis didn't want her to go out. Eileen went out and got super rowdy at the bar, yelling at people, dancing on the bar, all kinds of wild shit. 
The bartender told her it was time to go, and Eileen got pissed and threw a cue ball at his head. Eileen was arrested for assault and battery, and she was bailed out when a friend of hers showed up with Eileen's purse that had a bunch of Lewis's cash in it. Three days later, Eileen's brother Keith died from throat cancer and left her a $10,000 life insurance payout, which, is, which would come in handy for Eileen after this next bit. So she probably invested it, went back to school, got a nice job, and uh, lived happily ever after with her nest egg. No, we're going to talk about that. It was, oh, it was gone okay. in three months. Oh. <laughs> mm. Lewis is probably like, why don't you just come home and make a <laughs> <laughs> That's what it said that the in the book I was reading. Monster said he just wanted to watch TV, like hang out at home, watch TV, and bang. And y- yeah, I can relate. She's like, "Hey, fucko, I'm 21, 2021. 20, I want to go out and party a little bit." How old was he? Like sixty nine. Sixty nine. I want to. I don't want to party. <laughs> I want you to lick my shaggy balls. <laughs> guys, want to go party? Well, I, guess, I guess there are some complications from marrying, uh, you know, with the big age gap. Yeah. Who, th- who would have thought that mm. it wouldn't, there'd be problems arising. <laughs> I just thought love was love. That's right. It's pre-Viagra, so I wasn't always hard. <laughs> I don't know why Larry Flint, I don't know why Lewis sounds like Larry Flint. I just like make, doing that voice. <laughs> so like we were just saying, she wanted to go out and party. He wanted her to stay home and be this trophy wife. And when she wasn't going for it, Lewis thought maybe if he cut off Eileen's money that she would comply with what he wanted because he gave her like this weekly spending limit. And this backfired on Lewis. When he told Eileen that he was taking away her money, she beat the shit out of him with his cane and then put a meat skewer up to his throat. About this, Eileen said, quote, Sure, I threatened him with a meat skewer. So fucking what? He looked at me like all men did, right from the off. Dirty old fucker. (laughs) God damn. (laughs) Well, I bet he didn't like that one bit. He didn't. (laughs) What? (laughs) And before this incident, she had already given him a black eye once. Oh, boy. So this was the the meat skewer up to his throat. That was enough for Lewis. Meat skewers, knuckle sandwiches. Where does it end? <laughs> that young poon's not always worth it, fellas. <laughs> it's not worth it. Don't tell me. Tell him over there. <laughs> She's not marriage material, Ian. She's fucking crazy. <laughs> Mr. Flint, are you trying to say her beaver is not worth it? <laughs> the beaver's not always worth the juice. <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> not always worth the juice. <laughs> so eileen pawned her wedding ring and the two were divorced on july 19th 1977 then on august 4th 1976 eileen pled guilty to that assault charge and paid a 105 dollar fine from there using that ten thousand dollars from keith's life insurance and money from her ring eileen brought a black pontiac and started drifting again and like i said like answered your question it was all that money was gone in three months oh, after boy. that so i assume the the prenup was either ironclad and or she had a terrible divorce attorney who didn't get her any of his money yeah i think i think lewis made sure that uh, nothing crazy was going to happen yeah. to his money that's smart in 1981 she ended up dating and living with a guy in florida whose wife had passed away and he was living alone according to eileen she really loved this guy But one night, the two of them got in a really bad fight, and Eileen took off. She bought a six-pack of beer, some whiskey, two Slim Jims, then went to a pawn shop to buy a gun and some bullets. You had me at six-pack of beer, whiskey, and Slim Jims. (laughs) This this is marriage material. Now we're talking. (laughs) Now we're talking. I was going to say, like, take a... (laughs) <laughs> drive away from that that gun shop with <laughs> buying the guns and bullets afterwards. Well, maybe yeah. not the best idea with all that, that booze, you know, but still six pack. Well, we need a 12 pack at least. Yeah. Or what do you do with six? Plus, I, you know, a handle of crown Royal black and then two slim gems. Does it get classier than that? <laughs> <laughs> now, Mike thinks he's marriage material. Here we go. Get up. Well, that's the way to a guy's heart. Is it not? It is. Imagine if they were those macho man, Randy Savage, big ass slim gems. <laughs> Whoo wee. I like the Tabasco ones. Those are good. Yeah, that's what I always get. 
I don't love like when you finish those, it leaves like a weird aftertaste in your mouth, like just the Tabasco mm. ones in general. But yeah, I like them. Dave, what's your favorite meat stick? <laughs> <laughs> I don't really eat a lot of beef jerky. I love beef jerky, like the like good stuff. Slim Jims, they are what they are. Gas station. I will say that uh, our pal Jared gave us some of the Bearded Butcher's new uh, jerky last week. It's fantastic. Very tasty. It's fantastic. It was the kind, like, it was nice and soft, so your temples weren't throbbing as <laughs> right, you're eating. Right, right. And it was, like, cut, like, into little tiny chips. So it's, you know, it's easier to eat, and yeah. you're not ripping off big slabs of it. I don't know if they're shipping that, but check it out, man. Bearded, yeah. Bearded Butcher's uh, jerky. It came in handy in Indy late at night yeah when no, neither none of you guys would walk to speedway with me and i had to fucking <laughs> sit there in my room grumpy eating a bag because i couldn't go get 2 a.m hot dogs it's like, i just want a hot dog i was gonna I suck w- your dick <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna walk with him until i found out the time i'm like no nah, i'm good <laughs> yeah so I had some jerky it was good the the black seasoning was my favorite but then you liked the uh hollywood the hollywood it was all delicious that's good stuff yeah. we are unpaid spokesmen so after Eileen robbed this convenience store, this is what she said about it. Quote, I walked out of the store real slowly because I was so drunk and I couldn't find my keys. I sat in the car for three minutes looking for them. Then I drove away and started hauling ass down the highway. Then the radiator blew and I had to stop. And these kids helped me push it to the gas station. I was wearing one of those country hats and I took that off and the shorts. So I was just in my bikini. I was trying to alter my description, and that's when the fucking cops arrived. In order to test his love for me, I held up a convenience store. If he loved me, he would have gotten me out of that fix. I didn't give a fuck. Spoiler, he did not get her out of that fix. (laughs) Um, And Eileen was sent to prison for robbery in May of 1982. She's out of control, man. It's like something from a movie. Like she's wearing a bikini, a bikini yeah, right. armed robbery while doing it. The fucking what drunk. Is, I also want to know what a country hat is. Does she mean like a cowboy hat? I think that's what or she Or is meant. it like a, yeah. like a trashy, like, you know, trucker hat that's like old and, you know, it's like I, a Chevy logo on it or something. I would think cowboy hat. That's what that's popped what in I, my head. That's oh. what I picture. Okay. I could see the other one though, too. Just like any kind of like just old beat up trucker type hat. Yeah. Eileen liked a lot of biker not stuff a too. Uh, she was not wearing a fedora. <laughs> no, <no. laughs> she wore a lot of biker stuff too. A lot of leather jackets and mm. stuff. So she dressed like 1996 Shawn Michaels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> With his zip up assless chaps and his little biker gloves and his hat. It's ridiculous. <laughs> While she was in prison, she put an ad in the classifieds of a biker magazine looking for a pen pal. She was flooded with letters. And Eileen was released on June 30th, 1983. And going from there, she bounced all around Florida with some of these men that were writing her in prison. And it all kind of went the same. She comes into someone's life, shit gets fucking crazy, and then she's gone back on the road again. I could see how this would make a good movie. It's just nonstop craziness. Yeah. yeah. What'd she do with the Slim Jims? She eat those before she got arrested? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're going over to jail and you're just they're going to sit there, I'll take them. Yeah. Like, cops, can I? Is this evidence or can I have these? <laughs> you can eat that? Yeah. Do you need to put these like in a bag and like <laughs> lock them in a warehouse somewhere? Or can I? Can I have these? Is there something interfering with your happiness? Something keeping you from achieving your 2020 goals? Let's face it; these are certainly trying times. From being cooped up inside your home to wondering how you're going to pay next month's bills, we're all experiencing some form of stress or strain on our mental health. And for that, BetterHelp is here for us. BetterHelp is an online mental health provider that will assess your needs and match you up with your own licensed professional therapist. The best part? No waiting rooms. That's a pretty big deal if you're as impatient as I am. BetterHelp is a safe and private online environment that will have you communicating with a counselor within the first 24 hours. And once you've begun, you can send your counselor a message at any time, always getting a helpful response in a timely manner. You even have the ability to schedule weekly video or phone sessions, all from the comfort of your very own couch. BetterHelp is available worldwide and has a broad range of expertise available, including licensed professional counselors who specialize in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, 
family conflict, LGBT matters, grief, and self-esteem. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're currently recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. Not happy with your counselor? No worries. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches and makes it easy and free to change counselors if needed. Remember, everything you share with your BetterHelp counselor is completely confidential. And while it's not a crisis line, it is a convenient, professional, and affordable way to seek the help you deserve. Financial aid is even offered to those who qualify. Want to hear how BetterHelp assisted people just like you? Check out the testimonials posted daily on their site. Look, we here at Necronomapod want you to start living a happier life. So, as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting BetterHelp.com slash Necro. Join over 1 million people already taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's BetterHelp, better H-E-L-P dot com slash Necro. From 1983 to 1986, besides bouncing around with these guys, Eileen made her money as a sex worker. And like we said before the break, just like this tornado coming into people's lives, shit just gets destroyed and then she leaves. Uh, She had tons of arrests for assault, pulling guns on people. It was at this point in 1986, Eileen was just completely down and out. And she met Tyra Jolene, nicknamed Ty, at a Daytona gay bar. It was love at first sight for these two. Ty and Eileen lived in cheap motels and trailers and even in the woods a couple of times. Eileen supported them through sex work on Florida highways, mostly with truckers. However, according to Ty, she didn't approve of Eileen being a sex worker, once saying, quote, Once I found out she was prostituting, I tried everything I could to have her stop doing that. For one, it's not safe. And then I did care about her, but she she never gave it up. Eileen considered Ty to be her wife and later said that Ty had no problem spending the money Eileen was making as a sex worker. Eileen said, quote, It was love beyond the imaginable. Earthly words cannot describe how I felt about Tyra. I thought Tyra must be taken care of, as she herself had never been. The only reason I hustled so hard all those years was to support her. I did what I had to do to pay the bills because I didn't have another choice. I had warrants out for my arrest. I loved her too much. Then the fucking bitch sold me down the river. I hate that bitch. I suppose we're going to learn how she sold her down the river soon here. Yeah. I was going to ask, but I was like, well, I'll, I'll let the story play out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Before Eileen ended up hating Ty, they spent time together drinking in bars. And not surprisingly, Eileen frequently got into altercations and was being arrested. Between 1987 and 1988, Eileen was questioned by the police at least three times for hitting a man with a beer bottle, vandalizing her apartment, and then making death threat phone calls to a grocery store. I'm assuming someone there pissed her off. Oh, boy. Like she wasn't just randomly doing that. But (laughs) Hello, Kroger's. Do you have Prince Albert in a can? (laughs) Better let him go. Uh, And these were always aliases that she used when she got in trouble. She went by a ton of different names, including Sandra Kresich, Susan Lynn Blahovic, Lee Blahovic, Cami Marsh Green, and Lori Christine Grody. The Lee worked out good for her because that's what everybody called her. I didn't put that in the beginning, but oh, okay. no one called her Eileen in her life. Everyone just called her Lee. Easier to use an alias when it's your real name, I guess. Yeah. You don't have to remember your fake name. That stresses me out. I would if I was like living that life, like the, that drifter life, like trying to remember all your fake oh, aliases yeah. and stuff. Like Mike's in witness protection right now. His name's not Mike. <laughs> Sometimes he slips up and you have to edit it out. <laughs> yep. Because I say my name so often on here. <laughs> hey, Giuseppe. I mean, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> What's the <a> pizza pie? <laughs> <laughs> this brings us to Richard Mallory. At the time, on November 30th, 1989, Richard Mallory was 51 years old, and he owned Clearwater Electronics Repair. He was a really odd guy. Uh, He would randomly close his store for multiple days in a row and just disappear to be found on a huge drinking binge and paying for sex workers. Sounds good to me, pal. (laughs) He was extremely paranoid and was known to change the locks on his apartment multiple times a year. And was going as far as telling people 
that he wanted to get plastic surgery so people wouldn't be able to recognize him anymore. Are we sure he wasn't trying to escape Scientology down there in Clearwater? He could have been. Oh. They have not shut the door on that uh, either. No? Probably not. Probably not. Aside from him being very paranoid, Richard Mallory wasn't an angel like the prosecution would later paint him to be. Before he owned his repair shop in Florida, Richard Mallory spent 10 years in the Maryland State Mental Institution for raping a woman. Like we said earlier, this is all Eileen's story as to how things went down. And we'll see that during her trials that her stories change a lot over time. Even in the documentary, they change multiple times when she's talking. But this is the initial story before things get muddy with movie deals coming out and everything. On November 30th, 1989, Eileen was working Interstate 95 in Florida, and it was raining bad, like a downpour. There was a traffic jam, and she was walking down the highway. She ended up catching a ride with Richard Mallory. Eileen said that Mallory had already been drunk and was smoking weed, but the two of them stopped off at a couple stores once traffic started moving for more beer. Mallory just assumed that Eileen was a sex worker she says that she didn't bring it up first, but she said, yeah, and her rates were $30 for a blowjob and $100 for full sex. Is that a good price for a blowjob, Mike? 30 bucks? I mean, I charge a lot more for my blowjobs. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, it's worth it, though. Based on quality, I guess. You got to work the balls, Dave. That's it? That's the key. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't forget the balls. Helps the orgasmic experience. Is that right? I think. He's playing coin now. <laughs> <laughs> Eileen said that Mallory wanted a blowjob and he started to unzip his pants. She wanted Mallory to be fully naked first, because through this story, I learned that this is a way for sex workers to protect themselves. Like they're more likely to get out of a situation if a guy is fully naked, which that makes sense. Leaves the, leaves the guy vulnerable. And yeah, that makes, yeah, yeah I, I guess that. that's, I guess that's a common a common you're not, not going to jump out of the car and chase her if you're buck naked, butt naked, yeah. buck naked. I think it's buck, buck. People say butt. Yeah. People also think Pikachu has black at the end of his tail. <laughs> <laughs> also, Eileen was offended by the fact that he just wanted to unzip uh, because she said, quote, no man was ever going to zipper fuck me. God damn right. Mike heard that okay. countless times <laughs> in the past. I'm still trying to figure out what exactly she means by zipper fuck. Like, just like leave your pants on, right? Just, just leave them through the pants. So it's yeah. like the zipper's hitting you and she ain't having that. And she was just, yeah, she was disrespected by it. Okay. She's not going for a zipper fuck. She wants the full on experience. You don't want to feel denim, like rubbing up and down you like that. That hurt. Probably. It's not comfortable. Leave a mark. Yeah. You want skin on skin. She could like rip her lip on the zipper. There you go. Could catch something like in a, uh, um, there's something about Mary when Ben Stiller <laughs> zips his nutsack up. Oh, oh, God. <laughs> she went on a full bush on bush experience, Dave. <laughs> oh, I don't think anyone wants that. Except our friend. <laughs> our, our mutual our friend. Our mutual friend who likes that sort of thing. We'll never fully know what happened in that car. And Eileen tells the story in multiple different ways leading up to trial and after she, you know, after the trial, she says, I killed people in straight up cold blood. Uh, we'll, we'll never know. But we're going to go through these three accounts from Eileen. Quote, man, hookers are the same as cab drivers. You get good fares and bad fares. Some guys are OK and give respect. Others treat you like shit. Sometimes you get paid. Often the Johns complain. Straight hose strip round the world. Maybe a blow job. I ain't never been a social worker. Don't give green stamps. They want to fuck. They pay. Okay. They fuck up my head, rain on my parade. Then they got what come to them. Mallory, he wanted to cuff me and rape me. You know, that's what did it for me. It was his choice. Killing Mallory was nothing to me. I was cold and wet, just trying to hitch a ride. And this guy goes past stops and comes back. He was okay. At first he had a bottle of vodka then we stopped for beer at a gas station. He got Doritos and stuff. Sure, he just chatted. He was running late because of the traffic. And then we talked about sex. That's all they fucking want. 
I don't recall the time, maybe around 3 a.m., we crossed a river towards Daytona Beach. He pulled off the road, up a track, and into woods. We were in the front seats. I stripped and we drank some more beer. Smoked and kissed for a while. Just stuff. He was limp and got pissed with me. He hit me. Wanted to fuck me with his limp dick. I gave him a blowjob and then he went fucking crazy, like a crazy man. Slapped me some and held me down. And fuck you, man. No motherfucker does that to me. He was going to rape me. I'm telling you, like I told the judge, he was raping me. I was always short of money, so I guess sometimes I brought up sex. Mallory wanted to fuck straight off. He was a mean motherfucker with a dirty mouth. He got drunk and it was a physical situation. So I popped him and watched the man die. It's pretty matter of fact. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you've seen videos of Eileen talking. There's, yeah. there's one version that I personally find very oddly charming. Mm-hmm. I find Eileen very, a very likable person. Right. But then she's that anger, that angry side of her snaps. And you could imagine her doing that. Yeah, her eyes go like completely fucking black when she gets mad. Uh, The second one, quote, see one guy, meaning Mallory. He was trying to screw me in the ass and stuff. He was going to anal screw, you know, anal screw or whatever you call it. So I started fighting with him and I got to my bag and I shot him. And then when I shot him the first time, he just backed away. And I thought to myself, well, hell, should I, you know, should I try to help this guy or should I just kill him? So I didn't know what to do. So I figured, well, if I help and he lives, he's going to tell on me and I'm going to get it for attempted murder, all this jazz. And then I thought, well, the best thing to do is just keep shooting him. Then I get to the point. I thought, well, I shot him. The stupid bastard would have killed me. So I kept shooting, you know, in other words, I shot him. And then I said to myself, damn, you know, if I didn't shoot him, he would have shot me because he would have beat the shit out of me, maybe. I would have been unconscious. He would have found my gun going through my stuff and shot me because he probably would have gone to get it for trying to rape me. So I shot him and then thought to myself, well, hell, I might as well keep shooting him because I got to kill the guy because he's going to, you know, go tell somebody if he lives, whatever. Then I thought to myself, well, the dirty bastard deserves to die anyways because of what he was trying to do to me. So those three things went in the mind for the guy that I shot. So the story shifted a bit there. A little bit. Different kind of uh, scenario. The third, which are from court filings and from the trial we're going to talk about in part two. Quote, around 5 a.m., Warnos disrobed to the act of prostitution. She asked Mallory to remove his clothes, but he said he only wanted to unzip his pants and didn't have enough money to pay her fee. Warnos said... She then went to retrieve her clothes, but Mallory whipped a cord around her neck and threatened to kill her, quote, like the other sluts I've done. He then tied her hands to the steering wheel, Warnos said. According to Warnos, Mallory violently raped her vaginally and anally and took pleasure from Warnos's cries of pain. Afterwards, she said that Mallory cleaned blood from his penis with rubbing alcohol, then squirted alcohol onto her torn and bloody rectum and vagina. Warno said Mallory eventually untied her and told her to lie down. Believing he intended to kill her, Warno said she began to struggle. Mallory, she said, told her, quote, You're dead, bitch. You're dead. At this juncture, Warno said she found her purse and removed her gun. Mallory grabbed her hand, and the two began fighting over the gun's possession. Warno won the fight, then shot Mallory. Warno said Mallory kept coming at her despite her warnings, so she shot him two more times. I mean, that leans towards justifiable self-defense if that was the correct story. Now you got three stories, though. <clears throat> yeah. Which is the real story, Ian? Tell us now. <laughs> we need to know. I mean, I feel like all of those would qualify for self-defense if that's what happened. Yeah. It does not help her case that she has three different stories. No, that would never help like if this one we just read was the case and she stuck to it, you know, every time we'd be talking about something else right now. Well, and then if she didn't kill anyone else, though. Yeah, there's that. <laughs> well, that would well, <laughs> like this, if she was one and done and this was the story, then yeah. I but agree. then if this was if that was the answer, then there may not have been other ones. It's a good point. It's a good point. 
After killing Mallory, Eileen met up with Ty, which must have been that night or the next day based on when police found the car. But we're going to see Ty lies a lot. And since Eileen's story changes a ton, we're just going to, there's these like kind of gray areas in the outline, which really drives me crazy because I like to tell a chronological story. But we're going to see this too with Henry Lee Lucas um, with these drifter killers. It's really hard to, you know, stick to a clear timeline of what they were up to or even know what's the truth and what isn't the yeah, truth. Yeah, because if you're getting a story from them, who knows? That's it. Yeah. This is Eileen's story, and that's and it's confusing as fuck trying to put it into order. Ty said, quote, Lee came home early one day in December with a two-door Cadillac with tinted windows and a gator plate on the front. We used this car to move from Ocean Shores Motel to an apartment on Burley Avenue. Later that night, I came home from work. Lee told me she had shot and killed a guy that day. She later told me that she had covered his body with a piece of carpet and then left the car in some woods off John Anderson. When we moved in on Burley, she had gotten some things in which she showed me something with the name Richard on it. She gave me a gray jacket and scarf, which I believe she had gotten from that car, which she did. She did the, oh, that's creepy. That stuff was from that car. This jacket. Here, Ty, you want this members only jacket I found in the, <laughs> this car? On December 1st, 1989, police found Mallory's Cadillac abandoned not far from where Eileen and Ty were living. The doors of the car were left open and the interior lights were left on. Police noticed bloodstains behind the steering wheel and the keys were missing. Close to the car, they found Mallory's wallet buried in the sand that contained Mallory's license, some receipts, and two expired credit cards. Police dusted the car for fingerprints, but they found nothing that could be used. There was also a trail of shit leading from the car, like up the road, like Eileen, the hotel. like Eileen and Ty were like partying or something out there. There trail was of poop. No, a trail of stuff. Oh, oh. oh okay. <laughs> like half, uh, half empty bottles of vodka. Like, like literally like they had a fucking party walking home from this. Oh, a waste boy. of alcohol. Half yeah. empty. Come on. So they're not good criminals. No. But even if you look at that quote from from Ty, none of that makes sense to what the actual timeline was. She killed Mallory on, on November 30th. You know, it would have happened pretty quick. And right off the mm-hmm. bat, she says one day in December. It would have been. Yeah. You know. Okay. Doesn't add up. Like she talks about how she arrived later that night, got home from work and Lee told me she had shot and killed a guy that day. Well, that didn't happen. You know, that's not accurate. Are there going to be questions down the road here as to what her culpability is in this whole thing? I suspect there might be. A little bit. Yeah. Her knowledge of everything, you know, how innocent she was in, in knowing some stuff. Yeah, I can see that forming. No. At 2.25 p.m. on December 6th, 1989, Eileen went to OK Pawn and Jewelry in Daytona, to pawn a Minolta Freedom camera and a Radio Shack radar detector that belonged to Richard Mallory. Eileen got $35 for this stuff, and she was using the name Cami Marsh Green, and this is going to come back to haunt her next week. Do people still use radar detectors? Is that still a thing? I thought that Waze app kind of... I'll say I use Waze, and it's it's the most, uh, you know... Every cop is on the Waze app. Like, it's very reliable. Mm -hmm. Way more so than a radar detector. Yeah. Waze is fantastic. Saved me lots of tickets that (laughs) way. Lots of tickets. No one was really looking for Mallory because people who knew him knew that he just disappeared sometimes. On December 13th, 1989, two guys who were looking for scrap metal found Mallory's body about five miles from where the police found his car. Mallory's body was under a piece of cardboard and only his fingers could be seen by the men who found him. He had already significantly started to decompose, but he was fully dressed with his belt undone. So at least that lines up. Zipper fucking. The zippers, some missed evidence next week, whether it was up or down. I don't think we were talking about zippers so much this week. It's interesting. Well, it matters. Well, yeah. If a zipper was down. No, then, I get it. Then. I know what you mean. I just, if you would have told me, Mike, what are the odds you talk about zippers a lot tonight? I said, yeah, 
Hey, hey, hey Chuck, <laughs> not so good. Slim to none, pal. Yeah, probably not. We don't do a lot of zipper talk in the show. I don't know if you heard, if you ever listened, but we don't do a lot of zipper talk. <laughs> yeah, we think that the crime scene photos would clearly show the zipper if they were taken properly. Yeah, there's some questions with mm. that, the zipper. Are you saying the police forensics lab didn't properly execute their uh, job on this one? Hmm. Intriguing. Makes me want to come back next week. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't had a good case of uh, police uh, incompetence in quite some time. I believe the term is police fuck uppery. Fuck uppery. Fuck That's uppery. a good word. There's some major police fuck uppery next week with. Uh, God damn. With some movie deals. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's where we'll pick back up in part two. We'll get into all that movie deal bullshit. Uh, the rest of the murders, her trials. Like I said, that movie deal stuff. There's so much manipulation going on with Eileen. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. All this stuff. And then her eventual execution. Wow. Spoiler alert. Thanks. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. Well, Mike I, had no idea that I was know, coming. He didn't. I 100% thought. Oh, we know. Yeah. I didn't even know she got caught. I thought she was still at large. <laughs> I didn't think that. But it could have been for as much as I knew. It's like I thought she was in the Florida backwoods still. We're going to get all of our classic stuff next week. Some police incompetence. Mm. A little corruption. Some death penalty discussion. Good stuff. So, so we're just, we're just going to go back to the, uh, the greatest hits and nothing new. It's going to go back to our old content. Yeah. You could literally just play every other episode. It's going to be the same discussion. I'll bring up Speedway hot dogs. You know, bring up raccoons. Larry Flynn will join us. What about a beaver? I just like to say beaver. I, every show has to have a beaver. Thank you, Mr. Flynn. No problem. Please, please go back to the green room with uh, <laughs> President Clinton. All right. Well, started off really depressing, then got very uh, intriguing and interesting. It is an interesting story. Yeah. I'll be curious what the sympathy level is at the end of this. You mean from you? Yeah, from me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Just to see what yeah. I think about this next week. I agree. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think it's an interesting discussion. I know how Ian feels, but we'll save that. I need people to come back, right? Yeah. At the end of the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, if they want to. <laughs> you, you like people watch the documentary and stuff. You see, like all these people say, like, "Oh my god, she's super scary," and like she definitely is when she gets angry. Yeah, but I, there's this this charm to her, and it's not even that I my sympathy for her her story. I, I feel like it's that small town thing. I was talking to Angie about it. I'm like, there's some charm about her, like growing up in a small town like that. Like there's people that I'm like, oh yeah, that's kind of like an Eileen. Mm. Like the old, okay. remember I told the story about the lady that used to give me cigarettes when I was little, that I would go up to her house and get cigarettes from her. Yeah. She was like an Eileen. Okay. So I'm like, there's this, this charm to her, but well, in all fairness, when she gets mad, she gets real fucking mad. She gets scared. Clear. Yeah. We talked about him earlier, but again, like with the charmness, like in the likability, like Ed Kemper, you watch those videos and you're like, that's, I kind of like this guy. Yeah. You know, so it's, I don't think it's just stuck to her or being a female necessarily. There's just something about some of these people where they're just charismatic and they're just, you know, they just have a personality that, you know, sometimes you, you can, can be attractive. Right. And it's not like Eileen wasn't, uh, you know, I mean, we went through it. She really made a lot of, a lot of people's lives hell leading up to the right. Richard Mallory. I mean, you know, she fucked over a ton of people and everything was everybody else's fault. It was never her fault. It was just and, chaos. Yeah. She beat an old guy with a cane. And by account, she fucked him up with that cane. Oh, that's horrible. Any final thoughts on uh, part one? I almost said part two. Jump the Necronomapod does not approve nor endorse elder abuse. We don't like when old people get beat with a cane. Well said. I'm going to save my other thoughts till next week. Ian, any other thoughts on this one? No, that's it. It really took a, it was a rough start, this one. Not reading the notes ahead of time really is a kick in the dick when you got like a start like that. God damn. Yeah, she didn't have much of a chance. No, never. Well, you would think, you know, being what, 14, 15 years old, living at the end of the road in the woods in the winter in Michigan, somebody might help you out. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people that 
that felt bad after the fact. Like I said, those those boys came forward later in uh like when the trial and stuff was everything was going on. Like as a character witness, like with they had remorse for doing that. There's a lot of people that had remorse for not helping her out. Which is also something different, I think, than most stories, right? Like we don't hear a lot of people coming out of the woodwork saying, Oh, I feel bad I could have done more. Yeah. For any of the stories really we've covered, we haven't really touched on anything like that. Not really for any serial killers that I can think of. That's a good point. And certainly a lot of people grow up in those same conditions and don't turn into serial killers. Yeah, we're going to see next week. I guess it's all how you look at Eileen Warnes' case. How you feel about it, I guess. I mean, it's definitely a debate between serial killer or self-defense. Or what is perceived as self-defense by the person. And I think it's an yeah. interesting case. Definitely. Yeah. I think you're really going to like it, Mike. I hope so. <laughs> I'm tired of being let down. Maybe I'll read the notes next time and take a more immersive wow. view into this case. I'm a busy man. I know. I pull the nine directions, even as we speak. <laughs> like right now, that toilet's calling me. I really got to pee. <laughs> All right. We got some uh, new patrons. Take a swig of beer real quick to wet the whistle. Thank you very much to Adrian Marino. Vanessa. I'm going to guess it's Medina, but it could be Medina, our hometown. <laughs> I'm going to say both and just cover it. It's Medina here over in Saudi. It's Medina. And on any GPS tracker, it's Medina. Or any telemarketer that calls you. Cooper Daniels, Prieto Torres, Amanda Anthony, Man Bear Bish, Kayla Ritchie, Melinda Winyard, Haley, Terry McIntyre, Misty Losecki, Estefania Hernandez, Josie Paladin, Bill Littleton, Official Xnix, Craig Anderson, Sarah Samozi, please don't shout me out. Well, sorry. Jen Peterson <laughs> Too and late, Buster. Nicole Pierce. <laughs> Buster. <laughs> Thank you all very much. We are at patreon.com slash Necronomapod. Ian, what do you got? For iTunes, I have one for Carol Lynette, Tay Camp1234, Sir Slaughter, Nidia Tevin9. Holly Beasy. Um, I think that's Ho- Holy Beasy. And Holy Beasy. Thank you guys for the awesome reviews. <laughs> is it Holy or ho- Holly? No, it's, ho- it's <laughs> Holly for real. <laughs> Wait, it's what? <laughs> <laughs> Holly, Be- Holly Beasy. Oh, okay. You said Holy. <laughs> Did I say Holy? Yes. Oh, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Remember Holy Garrett? Yeah, yeah. She's still out there. <laughs> hey, Holly. Holy Holly Garrett. Her review, she said that her mom, sister, and I all listen to the podcast. Nice. Hello, it's a, ladies. It's a foursome I'd like to have. <laughs> <laughs> FFFM. <laughs> <laughs> Mike and four female fans. That's what I meant. Yeah. Three. Three female. Three. Sorry. Yeah. It's not get carried away. <laughs> we don't have four female fans. <laughs> well, apparently we have too many female fans according to Blue Chill, but don't get me started. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Holly, Holly, whatever you go by. Dave and I don't know. Ian's reading it off his phone. So at this point, we don't know what your name is. It's going to be like Haley. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> She's like these fucking assholes. <laughs> we thank you nonetheless. Dave, what do you got? I don't have anything. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we are on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube at Necronomapod, Amazon.com search Necronomapod for all of our merch, Patreon.com slash Necronomapod. Still got some stickers at Necronomapod.com. Stickers at Necronomapod.com. Three packs. Three packs. They're going like hotcakes. Almost gone. Almost gone. All right. Thank you guys very much. All right. You guys ready for a cool down beer? Cheers. <laughs>